morning, everyone, and again to all of you who are online, welcome to Prestonwood, wherever you are. We know that God is with us and he's working in us in great ways, and we pray God's richest blessings upon your lives, your family, uh, this very day. Uh, take your Bibles and turn with me to Romans chapter 8, the 8th chapter of the book of Romans, and today... We're going to speak of one of the great verses in all of the Bible, Romans 8, 28, and in addition to that, to speak of the security and the certainty that God's Word brings to us. This, of course, is a beloved and believed verse in the Bible. It's cherished by Christians everywhere through generations. Uh, we know it. I hope you are not so familiar with this verse verse 28 of Romans 8, that you miss the impact every time you read it because it is profound. Really, uh, when you speak of Romans 8, 28, you are speaking of uh, the very heart of God's Word and the purposes and the plans of God uh, for each one of us. It truly is a promise upon which we pillow our heads and trust in God throughout our lives. Sometimes we don't know exactly what is happening in life. I uh, read of a bricklayer who fell out an accident report. Uh, this was on December the 4th, 1958, so it's been a while ago, but he was applying for insurance coverage based on uh, the accident he had, and so the insurance company inquired of him a little more about the accident, and so here's what he said in a letter to the insurance company. Dear sir, I'm writing in response to your request for additional information in block number three of the accident reporting form. I put poor planning for the cause of my accident. And you asked for a fuller explanation and I trust the following details will be sufficient. I am a bricklayer by trade. And on the day of the accident, I was working alone on the roof of a new six story building. When I completed my work, I found I had some bricks left over which weighed uh, were, uh, which weighed later were found to weigh 240 pounds. Rather than carry the bricks down by hand, I decided to lower them in a barrel by using a pulley which was attached to the side of the building on the sixth floor. Securing the rope at the ground level, I went up to the roof and swung the barrel out and loaded the bricks into it. Then I went down and untied the rope, holding it tightly to ensure a slow descent of the 240 pounds pounds of bricks. You will note on the accident report form that my weight is 135 pounds. <laughs> Due to my surprise at being jerked off the ground so suddenly, I lost my presence of mind and forgot to let go of the rope. Needless to say, I proceeded at a rapid rate up the side of the building. In the vicinity of the third floor, I met the barrel, which was now proceeding downward at an equally impressive rate of speed. This explains the fractured skull, the minor abrasions, and the broken collarbone as listed in Section 3 Accident Reporting Form. Slowed only slightly, I continued my rapid ascent, not stopping until the fingers of my right hand were two knuckles deep into the pulley, which I mentioned in paragraph two of this correspondence. Fortunately, by this time, I had regained my presence of mind and was able to hold the rope in spite of the excruciating pain I was now beginning to experience. At approximately the same time, however, the barrel of bricks hit the ground and the bottom fell out of the barrel. Now devoid of the weight of the bricks, the barrel weighed approximately 50 pounds. I refer you again to my weight of 135 pounds. As you might exa uh, exa imagine, I began a rapid descent down the side of the building. In the vicinity of the third floor, I met the barrel once again coming up, and this accounts for the two fractured ankles, the broken tooth, and severe lacerations of my legs and lower body. Here my luck began to change slightly. The encounter with the barrel seemed to slow me enough to lessen my injuries when I fell into the pile of bricks, and fortunately only three vertebrae were cracked. I am sorry to report, however, as I lay there on the pile of brick, bricks in pain, unable to move, and watching the empty barrel six stories above me, 
I again lost my composure and presence of mind and let go of the rope. And I lay there watching the now empty barrel begin its journey back down onto me. This explains the two broken legs. I hope this experience, I hope this explains rather your inquiry as to my poor planning. I mean, you ever feel like that guy in life? You don't know whether you're coming or going. You don't know whether you're going up or down or sideways. There's a lot of pain in the process. You don't know whether to hold on or to turn loose. It just seems like life is one big accident waiting to happen. It happens and luck has nothing to do with it. As a matter of fact, we have something that is better than insurance or an insurance claim. We have something called assurance. The blessed assurance that we have in Jesus Christ. The certainty and the security that we know because we know Jesus. So in verse 28 of Romans 8, the scripture says, for we know that all things are working together or rather, I like to say as it's best translated that God is causing all things to work together for good to those who are called according to his purpose. For those, and then watch the frame as God finishes the sentences. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. In other words, Jesus our elder brother and savior in God, he has been the forerunner of the forever family of God. And then verse 30, and those whom he predestined, he also called, and those whom he called, he also justified, and those whom he justified, he also glorified. We touched on Romans 8, 28, the last time that we were together. And we said that this is the promise that comes from God, and God always, always keeps his promises, and that this promise is inclusive. It is inclusive of believers because it says we know, those of us who know Christ, we know that this is true. This promise is given to those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. We have been called into the family of God, more about that in just a moment. And we have chosen to believe and receive him by loving him. Loving God is tantamount to believing and trusting in God. So this is, as my friend O.S. Hawkins says, a family secret. Uh, This is something that is given to us as the people of God. Because we believe not in fat chance or blind luck or fate or the fortuitous conjunction of circumstances, things just happening. No, we believe that God has a plan for every life. And you, my friend, are a plan of God. And God has a purpose for you. That plan is not all about you. It is ultimately all about Him. But in the meantime, before we get to heaven, we live in this confidence. We live in this certainty that we as believers belong to Him, and not only now, but forever. Listen, We can know that we're saved and going to heaven. You can know it for sure. These things are written, God's Word, that you may know that you have eternal life. We are to live with this kind of confidence and this kind uh, of certainty. You ought not to be, as I say, uh, a question mark with your back all humped over, but you ought to be a walking exclamation point. You ought to be able to say, I know that I know that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior, and that I'm on my way to heaven. This we know. And because we know this, inclusive of the family of God, all of us who are believers, we live with this security and this certainty. Is there anything better than knowing that your sins are forgiven? that God's Spirit, Christ Himself, lives in you, knowing that heaven is in your future, that salvation is yours now, is there anything better than knowing this? One thing, knowing that all your sins are forgiven, knowing 
that Christ lives in your life, knowing that you've been given salvation in Christ and that you can never lose it. That you can never lose this eternal salvation that we have in Christ. This is the forever plan of God. And we see it in this passage. The immutable, unfailing, infallible, eternal promises of God. That we know as believers that God is working. It is inclusive of all of us. No exemptions, no exceptions. No one is excluded in the family of God. This is, this is for you, dear believer. But not only is this great promise of God inclusive, but we also know that this promise of God is comprehensive. For we know that all things work together for the good to them who love the Lord, to those who are called according to his purpose. That is comprehensive of all things in our life. Not everything is good in life. There is a lot of bad in our lives at times that we can't understand and whether it be tragedies or trials or tests or all the rest, we know that all means all, that God is working together in all things for our good. And even when we can't understand it, we can know that God is always working as we just sang. Even though we can't feel it, we know that God is working because God promised us in everything, in all things, He is working together for good in our lives. Now that's a great promise because it means the small things, the big things, the little things, the giant things. It means the bad things. It even can mean our mistakes and failures and stumbles and fumbles and missteps and mistakes along the way. If you have a GPS system on your phone or in your car, you probably have uh, tried either Waze or Google Maps to get to a destination, and ultimately it will get you there if you follow the directions. But if you get off the path, what happens? It will reroute you and get you back onto the path so that you get to your destination. So God has a GPS system, and God has a plan and a purpose and a destiny for all of our days. And even when we get off the path and get off the track, even a rebellion against God, ultimately for the believer, he's working, he's moving, and he is changing things around, and he is giving us an an opportunity to get back on the path when we listen and obey him. So I'm saying even uh, those things which, even the sinful things, dare we say it, that God can use our sins and failures to get us on down the path and back on the path for his plan and purpose for our life. For example, Simon Peter. Jesus said to Simon Peter, you're going to deny me, but I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail and that afterwards you will strengthen your brothers. So Jesus said, Simon, you're going to deny me. But I'm going to use your denial and your sin. And what a sin it was when Simon Peter denied the Lord and disobeyed him and refused to stand for him at the cross, before the cross. And he was brokenhearted and sad and sorrowful, wasted after that experience, such sinful behavior. But later Jesus restored him. And he gathered with his disciples and spoke to his disciples. But even now, as I look back, on Simon Peter's life and to see how God used even his failure and even his sin and even his brokenness. It was his sorrow and repentance that rerouted him and got him back on track and God used him in such an incredible way. I'm saying that God can use even our sin and our brokenness and our failures when we repent and when we return to him that God uses that. I'm blessed even to this day and so are you by the truth that God used Simon Peter's sin to encourage me. Where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. And God, listen to this, God can draw a straight line with a crooked stick. God can draw a straight line with a crooked stick. And when life gets crooked, when I get crooked, God can overrule where he does not rule. 
Where God does not rule, he ultimately overrules. And God can redeem anything in our lives for his purposes. When he says all things, that means all things in our life. Nothing is beyond the ability of our God to transform our lives. The most dark and difficult things, even from abuse to accidents, from cancer, God uses them to bring healing and hope to you or to others around you. Even your sin can be forgiven and make you more dependent upon God than you've ever been in your life, humbled before the presence of the Lord. This promise is inclusive. This promise is comprehensive. And this promise is constructive. Where it says God is working all things or God is causing all things to work together for good to those who love him called according to his purpose. Meaning that God causes all these things to work together. God doesn't cause all the bad things. He permits all things. But he does not cause all things. He causes some things in our lives that are tough and rough and struggles and sufferings in our life. Yes, God may in that be in that disciplining us or chastising us or teaching us. The psalmist ended up saying after he had a rough experience in life, uh, he said, it was good that I was afflicted because I learned your statutes. And sometimes uh, uh, affliction and pain and struggle, it causes us to look to God as never before, but God reshapes us and makes us in the midst of that, even the broken parts and the broken pieces. He told Jeremiah to go down to the potter's house, and there he saw a man working uh, a piece of, uh, of clay on the wheel and spinning it and working it. And if you will, if you... Take a look at that illustration. The wheel is is similar to the circumstances of life. And this this potter is is working as the wheel is turning. And the circumstances, uh, in effect, are changing. And his hands are moving and kneading and working. And Jeremiah saw that at the potter's house, the the, the clay or the the vessel was marred having having made it. And there was a there was a chip or, or there was a crack. And so what did he do? He remade it. He shaped it. And that's what God does with us. He gives us the redemption of knowing that he is shaping and forming and making us a beautiful vessel for the glory of God. That's what God is doing in your life. It's the story of Joseph, isn't it? The, the, the purest example, at least in the Old Testament, is of Joseph, who was a favored child of his father, blessed by the hand of God. He had great dreams. His brothers despised him and hated him for it. So one day they took Joseph, stripped him of his beautiful robe that his father had given him, and threw him in a well and left him there to die. Along came some slave traders, Midianites, and they took Joseph into Egypt. And it appeared that all of Joseph's dreams were gone, nightmares. And though he's just 17 years old now, he becomes a slave in Egypt. While a slave in Egypt, he rose to prominence in the household where he was working. He was put in charge of everything because he had an excellent spirit. He was such a a strong and vital young man and a hardworking young man. And so he was given responsibility and then he was falsely accused by Potiphar's wife, his boss's wife. He was falsely accused of sexual abuse and a physical attack, and though he didn't do it, he ran to protect his own integrity and character. He was accused and falsely accused and thrown into prison, not for doing the wrong thing, but for doing the right thing. Now where's your dream, Joseph? Now, Joseph, where's your God? And so he languishes in prison. And for 13 years, and finally he is released from prison, and because of his ability to determine dreams and his excellent ideas that he brought before Pharaoh, he was put in charge, second in command of all of Egypt, all of Egypt. 
He had gone from the pit to the prison to the pinnacle to the palace. He was, in fact, prime minister of Egypt and responsible for a big portion of, of Egypt's ec economy. And so one day, because of a famine, his brothers showed up at the palace. And Joseph, they didn't recognize him. He had changed, of course, in 13 years. Probably now looked like an Egyptian. They didn't know it, but he knew them, and he wept when he saw them. So what did Joseph do? It was his time to retaliate. It was his time to take his brothers out for what they had done to him. But no, what did he say? In Genesis chapter 50, when he looked at them and he said, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. Amen. That he would not only save many people, but save his own family in the plans and in the providences of God. Today, we are going to come to the Lord's table and share in the Lord's Supper. And of course, the most powerful example of how God takes evil and turns it around and transforms it is the cross. When man did his worst, God did his best. And when Jesus died, he died for our sins and he bore our sins on the cross so that we might be forgiven and pardoned and changed by his power, redeemed by his power. And in this, sin was transformed and we were transformed because God was working comprehensively and constructively in our lives. God is working now. This word is the word synergy. God is working. And we can trust the fact that if you're going through something right now, we can trust in the God who said, I will make all things new. Today, I just read this before I got here, is National Mulligan Day. I don't know who makes up these days. If you find out, maybe don't tell me, tell Mike Buster. Uh, but there are 1,500 of them, 1,500 different day celebrations of all kinds. This is also National Pasta Day. I guess they obviously have to put more than one day on a day. Uh, so, but today uh, is National Mulligan Day. David Shivers is really happy about that. You get an extra mulligan today, but don't be playing golf on Sunday. Uh, there's no rule about that, by the way, just a joke. Um, golf will wreck a, a good Sunday, I will tell you that. Uh, but listen, a mulligan, you know what a mulligan is? A mulligan is a do-over. And, you know, it's, if you're playing competitive golf, there are no mulligans. But if you're playing casual golf, then maybe you could ask for a mulligan. You hit an errant, a mulligan. You hit an errant shot, and you say, may I have a do-over? And if you have nice playing companions, they may say, yes, do that again. Take a mulligan. Now, you don't want to be taking a mulligan every hole. But you get a mulligan. There, you can ask for too many mulligans and, and do-overs. And it, it, it makes golf a little bit more fun sometimes to, to have a do-over. Everybody needs a second chance, a second shot. But here's something wonderful about what we have in Christ. It's much more than a mulligan. Much better than a do-over. It's not just a second chance or a second shot. It is a transformation of everything in our lives. It is the redemption of our lives. And the catalyst of all of this is the cross. God is always working in us even before we were born. He has a perfect plan in our lives for our good and His glory. And we are to live in the total trust and joyous gratitude of faith because we know that God's plans are going to be fulfilled in our lives. And we see that in what we call the golden chain. There are five words that I'm going to show you here which represent links in a chain, a golden chain, a strong chain that, that assures us and convinces us that we are the children of God now and forever.
Because I want to say, not only is this promise, Romans 8, 28, is it, in, is, it, is, uh, it is inclusive, it is comprehensive, it is constructive, God is always working, but it is also protective. Because here is uh, the promise. Look at the verses again, back in Romans chapter 8, verses 29 and 30. For those whom he foreknew, uh, circle or mark in your Bibles the word foreknew, he also predestined, there's another word to note and to mark, to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. That's the third word. That's the third foundational truth. That's the third link in the chain, called. And those whom he called, he also, there it is, justified. That's number four. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Number five, five links in this golden change. And by the catalyst of the cross, we now see how we are forever saved from eternity past to eternity future. Why? Because one of the foreknowledge of God. You see that word foreknowledge. This speaks of the wisdom of God. Foreknowledge speaks of the wisdom of God. You know what it is. It means to see in advance. But in particular here is it's a word which always, it also describes the word to know it is a word in the Bible which speaks of intimacy. It, it speaks of knowing well or knowing intimately. It speaks of love. And Adam knew his wife and she conceived and brought forth a son. The, the very physical act of marriage is, a, is, is an act of communication and and, and love that is expressed. So that's the word to know. So when you see foreknowledge, it, it in effect is saying God set his affection, God set his love, God set his heart on you before time began. According to the infinite wisdom of God, you, yes, you, are in the infinite heart of and mind of God. God set his eyes on you. God set his attention on you. God knew that a little boy living in the small town of Arkansas, when as a small child walked down in a tent revival meeting on a sawdust path, to profess faith in Jesus Christ and to begin following Jesus, God saw that little boy named Jack Graham before time began. Before I was in my mother's womb, that's foreknowledge. And what I'm saying about me, you can say about yourself if you know the Lord Jesus Christ. And even if you don't know him, he sees the beginning and the end. This is God's wisdom. But that second link in this chain that secures us forever, that holds us tightly now and throughout all eternity is the word predestined. We are also predestined. And this uh, speaks of the will of God, God's will. Uh, the word predestinate means the effective exercise of the will of God by which he brings before, determined by him, all things. And so God, who sees all things and knows all things, also predestines all things. In other words, predestination is a sure thing. If God says it's going to happen, it is going to happen. Now, we're going to take some time in the messages going forwards in Romans to talk about election and predestination in those subjects. But in this particular passage, the word predestined doesn't have anything to do with uh, belief or unbelief before you were saved. This has to do with Christians. This is a promise to you as a Christian that you are predestined to do what? To be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. So this is talking to believers once again. You, believer, God has a destiny for your life. He has a will and a purpose for your life. Now, it is God's desire that you come to Christ so he has then called you. That's the third link. And the word called here 
has to do with the effectual, fervent call of God upon our lives that brought us to Himself. And what is the call of God? This speaks of the ways of God. That God has not only chosen us, but that now God has called us to follow Him. He calls your name. He knows your name. He calls your name. And He invites you to come to Him. If you are not saved, if you don't know you're saved, this is God's call for you right now. His Spirit is calling, but God uses the gospel and faithful witnesses of the gospel. And what I'm saying to you right now is God's call to you to come to Christ if you don't know Him. Because whosoever will may come. Now, there are some people who believe that God only calls the called or only elects the elects or that He only died for the elect. No. Uh, The Scripture tells us that God loves everyone, that everyone is called, everyone can come to Christ, no one is excluded who wants to come to Christ. 1 Timothy 2, 3 to 6, look at this. This is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, uh, which is the testimony given at the proper time. So when you consider God's call, this effectual call, it means that everyone can hear this call. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, and not wishing that any should perish, that all should come to repentance. Predestinations, the callings of God, this does not mean God predestined some to be saved and predestined others to be damned. No, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The Bible says, whosoever will may come. Revelation 22, verse 17, the spirit and the bride say come. That's the spirit in the church, the bride say come. And let the one who hears say come. And let the one who is thirsty come. And let the one who desires take of the water of life without price. God is saying, come to me. I'm calling you to myself, and whosoever will may come. When you get right down to it, I don't want to oversimplify the mysteries of God in terms of His election, His preordination, and all the things that God has planned in His salvation, but the fact is, God says whom He will. We do not choose Him He has chosen us, but He has given us an opportunity. He has given us a choice in the calling to respond or not to respond. Did you know that you can resist the work of the Holy Spirit? Paul said to a group of people in the book of Acts, you do often resist the Spirit. The Bible says, my spirit will not always strive with a man. So you can resist the work of the Holy Spirit. Some say the 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 calling of God is irresistible. No, you have a choice. Jesus looked over Jerusalem and as he was on his way to the cross and he said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I would have gathered you to myself as a hen gathers the brood and with tears flowing down his face, he said, but you would not. Not that they could not, but you would not. Yes, you have a choice to make. God is calling but you must respond by faith and repentance and receive Christ into your life. This is the call of God. The whosoever wills, these are the elect, and the whosoever wants are the non-elect. And then finally, not finally, next to finally, there is justification. And this speaks, uh, this justification of the work of God. We won't need to cover justification that much this morning because we covered it uh, uh, very much in our previous lessons in the book of Romans. But justification means that we are made right with God. Justification speaks of the work of God in making us righteousness. Romans 4, 5, and to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted unto righteousness. We are made righteous by faith in Jesus Christ. And remember this, that justification, this work of God, is, is, um, is more than an acquittal, it's more than a pardon. 
we are not only forgiven and acquitted of our sins, but then we are then given the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ, right standing before God. And so watch this golden chain. We're talking about security now. We're talking about being an exclamation point, walking around with confidence and certainty that we're on our way to heaven. So God says, here's why you can know this, because I'm working everything together for the good in your life, for my glory, for your good, and it is because of my wisdom I have known you before the foundation of the world. I set my love and my heart and affection upon you. It is because of predestination, because, I mean, if this was the only verse in the Bible that spoke of eternal security, it's enough to believe in the eternal security of the believer. Because what God starts, he always finished. And he said, I have predestined you to be like Christ. And we, when we see Jesus, the Bible says in 1 John, we will, be, we will be like him because we will see him as he is. He's conforming us and making us like Christ. And this is the whole purpose of life for the, for the believer. And so that's the, that's the, uh, that's the wisdom of God. And, 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 and we are predestined. That's the will of God in our life and the ways of God as he calls us to faith and repentance. And then this justification, the work of God, the finished work of Christ. When we receive these elements in just a moment, the blood and the bread, it signifies the finished, completed work of Christ on the cross for you. It is done. It is over. It is accomplished. It is finished. And therefore, I am justified. I am justified in Christ. And one final thing, I am glorified. And this speaks of the worship of God. Because notice the tense of that verse. It doesn't say, I will be glorified. It says, we are now glorified. In the heart and mind of God, it's already happened. You're as good for heaven as if you were already there. You are now glorified in the sight of God. This is the golden chain. This is what keeps us and holds us. So that we can know that we know that because of what Christ has done, not by works of righteousness that we have done, but but according to his mercy, he has saved us. And before you receive of this cup and eat of this bread, you need to know for certain that you have this eternal life, that Christ lives in you, that you have been called and chosen of God and you have responded And said an everlasting yes to him. So would you bow your heads with me in prayer? I've been talking about assurance and security and certainty. Do you know that Jesus is your Lord and Savior? Do you know beyond any shadow of a doubt, do you know that you know that you know that Christ is in you, that you have been forgiven of all your sins, that you are right before God, not because of what he has done, but because of what Jesus has done for you? Do you know that you've been called, you said yes? Do you know that you're going to heaven when you die or when Christ comes again? Do you know this? If you do, I want to see your testimony. Just hold up your hand right now. You say, I, Pastor Jack, I know that I'm saved. Praise God, I know that I am saved. Praise Jesus, I know that I am saved. Amen. Some of you didn't lift your hand. You couldn't lift your hand because you don't know this. But you can know. You must know. The Bible says, can you really know this? Are these people just arrogant, all raising their hands? No. The Bible says these things are written that you may know that you have eternal life, even to them who believe on his name. When we believe, we receive this certainty, this confidence, this blessed assurance. And we hold our hands up today high, not in arrogance, but in humility. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. You couldn't lift your hand, but you want to know. You want to know Christ in your life. Some of you are watching on a screen somewhere, and you don't have this assurance. You don't have this confidence in Christ. I want to pray for you, and you can You can make that decision because this is God's plan. This is God's purpose for you. He brought you here or he brought you online to hear this message.
so that you could be saved. So how many of you would say, Pastor, pray for me. I want to be saved. I want to trust in Christ. Would you hold up your hand right now? If you're on a screen, just where you are, hold up a hand. That'll do you good. But right here in this room, will you hold up your hand and say, Pastor Jack, pray for me. God bless you. Are there others? Pray for me. I, I don't know that I'm saved. I don't know that I'm going to heaven. My friend, if, if I didn't know, I would stay here all day till next year until I, I know, I knew that I was saved. So would you raise your hand? I'm not going to point you out. I'm not going to embarrass you in any way. I just want to pray for you. Hold up your hand. In the terrace level? Yes, thank God. In the balcony? I can see your hands there. Lord, how we thank you for your word, which is the gospel, the good news of eternal life, the promise of eternal life. We thank you that we can hold up a hand and say, thank you, Jesus, we're saved. And for those who now say, Lord, save me. Lord, I want to know you. Lord, I pray that you would help them to know and to do right now what they'll be so glad they've done when they stand before you in eternity and until then. Because we know the greatest life of all, the only life to live is a life lived for you. So if you want to receive Christ into your life right where you are, pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me and dying on the cross for me. I believe you rose again. I hear your call. You're calling me. Lord, I'm saying yes. Yes, Jesus, come into my life. Yes, Jesus, forgive my sins. Yes, Jesus. Give me eternal life now and forever. I say yes, Lord, yes to your call. And if you're praying that prayer, you're inviting Christ into your life, online just text in 74788 and type in Jesus as the message. We're standing by to encourage you and help you answer your questions if you have questions. But, walk, but wherever you are, you can know Jesus now. And then right here in this room, right here, right now, before these plates are passed and the cup and the bread is given, say, thank you, Lord, for coming into my life. May I live for you in the power of your spirit until you come for me. Thank you for saving me now and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us for worship at Prestonwood. As you heard earlier, if you made a decision for Christ, please text Jesus to 74788. We would love to connect with you and give you these great resources to help you grow in your faith. One is a New Believer's Bible with helpful notes to help you study God's Word. The other is a book by Pastor Jack Graham on the next steps to take as you pursue this new life in Christ. As we close, I'd like to thank you for your faithful giving to support Prestonwood and the work God is doing through our ministries. If you would like to give, text the word GIVE to 74788 or visit prestonwood.org give. It's been a joy worshiping with you, and we look forward to seeing you again soon.